Mr. Bingler's Murder Maze Part 1 by Wilbur S. Peacock A suspense-ridden novelette Mr. Bingler was on the spot, for here was a case not covered by the situations described in his handy little instruction booklet for home detectives. But the little man's courage held out, even when he found himself lying next to a murdered man with his own sword umbrella sticking out of the corpse as surefire evidence. Chapter 1 Dreams of Empire Mr. J. C. Bingler mopped leisurely at the last trace of gravy with a piece of toast, his rabbity face calm with the pleasure that an animal feels with a comfortably filled stomach. He burped casually, stretched in indolent ease, sipped at the last of his weak tea. He peered myopically from the dim interior of the booth, happy that he had eaten before the evening rush of diners arrived. He could hear the clatter of dishes from the kitchen and the muted buzz of voices from the few diners. He shifted a bit, felt the weight of the hat box against his rubber-shod feet from underneath the seat where he had shoved it when first entering. He spooned a bit of vanilla ice cream into his mouth, then went utterly rigid as the voice in the booth behind him became suddenly loud enough for him to understand the words. Oh, dear, said Mr. Bingler weakly, horrifiedly. I tell you, he heard the voice go on, that Harvey Wilson has got to die. There's no time to waste. He's got to die tonight. Mr. Bingler gulped soundlessly, scrooched down into the corner of the booth as far as his small body would go. Horror at the casual brutality with which the words had been said tightened his mouth into a round O of astonishment. I don't like it, I tell you, a second voice said whiningly. It's too risky. Risky, hell. The first voice stopped long enough to permit a short, brittle laugh. I've got the whole setup planned, and there can't be a slip. There was the snap of a struck match, and cigar smoke drifted over the top of the booth. Listen, the voice continued. Trotter gets out of the pen day after tomorrow. His letter didn't say much, but reading between the lines told me plenty. He knows who I am, and he figures on blackmailing me white. Then when I can't pay any more, he'll squeal to the cops. No, if Wilson dies, you and I can collect a half million, and I can take care of Trotter later. I still don't like it. If things go wrong, I'll be left holding the sack. Shut up, the first voice was steely with a driving ruthlessness. You'll do as I say, or I'll see you occupy the same cell that Trotter is vacating. Mr. J. C. Bingler straightened a bit as the voice dropped to a low mutter. He pressed his ear against the booth panel, endeavoring to hear further, but was unable to make out another word. He spooned more ice cream, ate it untastingly his small body quaveringly tense with horror and excitement. Never in his most idyllic dreams of detecting had he thought that he would come face to face with a master villain plotting the sudden demise of another human. Gosh, said Mr. Bingler wonderingly, amazedly, soundlessly. He huddled there in the dimness of the booth, a small man with white hair, a tousle, his rabbity nose twitching with perturbation, his mind a chaos of conflicting thoughts. He knew that he should go to the cops with his information, but he knew, too, that the fragment of conversation he had heard was not enough for the police to act upon. In fact, now that he gave the matter deliberate consideration, he could see that he could do little more than accuse two men of plotting a murder. Mr. Bingler fumbled under the seat for his hat box, slid out of the booth, careful not to peer into the adjoining booth. He didn't want to disclose the fact that he had overheard the conversation but would take a good look at the arch-villain and his henchman on his way to the cashier. He shrugged into his raincoat, set his aged derby squarely on his small head, caught up his furled umbrella. Then, with the hat-box swinging casually from his right hand, he swung around, went toward the cashier's desk. He flicked his eyes in an all-inclusive glance into the neighboring booth, ready to make a plunge for safety should its occupants detect his thoughts. Oh, dear, said Mr. Bingler and scowled petulantly. For the booth was empty of human occupants. While Mr. Bingler's mind had been occupied with the conversation he had overheard, the two plotting killers had quietly decamped from the vicinity. Mr. Bingler gazed helplessly around the restaurant, seeing only the orderly bustle of the evening service. He went slowly toward the front, caught sight of the two men just entering the taxi from in front of the restaurant. 
In that one glimpse, he could make out no details, and a shiver of apprehension raced up his spine that the two might get away without his catching a full view of their faces. Mr. Bingler scuttled toward the door at an abnormal speed for him. Something wrong, Mr. Bingler? Tony Andinelli asked from behind the register. Mr. Bingler stopped dejectedly at the door, seeing only the rear of the taxi as it whirled into the traffic. He came back to the register, carefully counted out thirty cents and tax. Did you know those two men who had the booth next to mine? he asked hopefully. Sure, Tony rang the register, dropped in the change. One man he's a name Reeves, the other I know no. They come here very often, Mr. Bingler felt the warm glow of corning success in his scrawny chest. Tony shook his head. No, he said easily. Mr. Reeves, he come once or twice a week. This is first time I see other, he frowned. What's a mat, Mr. Bingler? Ice is something wrong? Mr. Bingler laughed, shook his small head in, what he hoped was an air of carefree nonchalance. Not a thing, Tony, he said. I was just curious. He went toward the door, conscious of the Italian's gaze on his back, feeling the triumphant glow burning brighter in his breast. He stood for a moment in the coming dusk, breathing deeply of the heavy air, the smiling lift of his mouth giving his face the look of a slightly puzzled gnome. Then he set off down the street, his rubbers padding a steady rhythm on the sidewalk, the umbrella swinging jauntily in the crook of his elbow. Mr. G. C. Bingler was in his element, lifted above the mundane routine of an unfeeling world. He was confronted by a mystery that promised to be a Lulu, a mystery in which master villains laughed fiendishly and plotted brutal murders, a mystery that was just waiting for Mr. Bingler's detective talents to solve. Poor Mr. J. C. Bingler and his dreams of empire. Chapter 2 The Home Detective Course Mr. Bingler entered the apartment that had been his home for years, racked his umbrella, hung his hat and boxed his derby, then set his gleaming rubbers beside the hall tree. Catching up the hat box with its new derby, he went toward the bedroom, switching on the lights as he went. He scowled pleasantly as he went, his troubled mind wrestling with his problem. Placing the hat box on the neat counterpane of his bed, he removed his clothes, hung them carefully in the single closet. Clad in his birthday suit, he entered the tiny living room again, dialed a number on the phone he had had installed less than a week before. He relaxed a bit when he heard the even tone of the man he had called. Captain Donovan, he said, this is Mr. G. C. Bingler. I wondered if you would give me a little information. Any I can, Captain of Detectives, Donovan said cheerily. I haven't forgotten the help you gave the department a short time ago. Mr. Bingler flushed a bit in modest pride, the red tiding down his bare and skinny body. Thank you, Captain, he said modestly. I just wanted to know who a man named Trotter is. He's to be released from prison day after tomorrow. A note of caution crept into the detective's voice. Why do you want to know that? he asked carefully. Well, Mr. Bingler said cautiously, I heard two men discussing him this evening, and I just got interested. Oh, Captain Donovan laughed expressively. I suppose your detecting is becoming rusty, and you thought you'd practice on him. Something like that, Mr. Bingler agreed. Well, you can forget him. He doesn't amount to much. He was sent up fifteen years ago for murder. His partner got away, and he never would tell who the man was. Because of doubt as to who did the actual murder, the jury recommended leniency at the time. He's to be released on parole. Thank you, Captain, Mr. Bingler said. I guess I got excited over nothing. He pronged the receiver, went directly to the bathroom, ran hot water into the tub. He hummed softly to himself as he shaved, knowing that his excitement had a very definite basis. For he had a prospective murder, a blackmailing convict, and two men of whom one was an ex-murderer, now plotting a new one. It was a perfect setup for a graduate of the home detective course, and Mr. Bingler held the mail-order rank of first-class investigator. He cleaned his straight razor, soaked for a luxurious fifteen minutes in the steamy tub. After scrubbing himself clean with soap and water, he massaged his skinny body with a huge towel, washed the tub, then reclaimed fresh underwear from the shifferable drawer. Clad in the drop-paneled BVDs, he brushed his sparse thatch of white hair, then moved to the neat bed. 
He broke the string on the hat box, conscious of a faint excitement that always came when he bought a new derby. His mouth puckered in a soundless whistling of a tune, thirty years dead, as he removed the box lid and reached in to remove the derby from its nest of tissue paper. Oh, dear, said Mr. Bingler, swallowing convulsively. His tiny fingers explored a bit, confirming what his myopic eyes were seeing. He gulped for air, his stomach gyrating beneath his ribs, heaving in an uncontrollable spasm of rending nausea. Oh, dear he said again very weakly, backtracked until a chair edge caught his knees and dropped his horrified body into its depths. He blinked desperately, hoping the thing would go away, pinched himself absently in the vague belief that this incredible scene was the main event in the nightmare. But the hoping and pinching did no good. The object within the hatbox remained in a very real and terrible way. It lay there in the crumpled tissues of the overturned hatbox a faint smile on its lips, its graying hair brushed carefully back from a high forehead. The skin was a ghastly greenish-blue, except for a pinkish tinge at the lips and cheekbones, and where the darkish cast of a heavy beard showed. It was not a particularly ugly head, in fact its owner must have been rather proud of its handsome regularity, but in Mr. Bingler's opinion it would have been less nerve-shattering had its owner still been attached. Mr. Bingler retched miserably, regretting his excess at the evening meal. One second he sat there while his stomach tied itself in knots. Then he headed miserably for the bathroom with its friendly conveniences. Slowly, oh so slowly, the neat apartment came back to its usual stability. Mr. Bingler loosened his bracing clutch on the chiffre robe, his stomach muscles sore and strained his skinny body still shock a bit within his loose underwear, and his mind was a maelstrom as it tried to cope with the suddenness with which it had been confronted by the horror in the hatbox. He absently flipped three peppermints into his mouth, savoring their biting flavor, fumbled for and lit his sixth cigarette of the day. His hand shook a bit with terrified excitement, and for a long moment his courage wavered like a shifting blob of gelatin. And then Mr. Bingler screwed up enough willpower to investigate, as prescribed in Lesson 2 of the Home Detective Course. He moved to the bed, reached out a comparatively steady hand, turned the box over even more so that the head rolled onto the counterpane. He swallowed twice, choking a bit as the peppermints dropped into his empty stomach. My goodness, said Mr. Bingler shakily. For the head... The gruesome thing had cleaned out Mr. Bingler like a stomach pump, was but a shell of wax made by some master craftsman to simulate death in a man's face. Chapter 3 Death Mask Mr. J. C. Bingler picked up the death mask, his flesh creeping a bit at the coolness of the wax. He coughed sheepishly, glanced guiltily toward the bathroom. He examined the mask, his royally mind trying to make sense out of the things that had happened to him in the past hour. He was not in the best of condition for coherent thinking, but gradually his blood pressure eased and his bookkeeper's mind began grasping the fringes of the mystery. He knew that a murder was to be committed that evening or night. Who the victim was to be had been clearly stated by the villain in the restaurant booth. The thought brought a cold sweat to Mr. Bingler. Maybe the villain was a sadistic monster who kept a visual record of his victims. Mr. Bingler laughed shakily, forced the thought from his mind. He stuffed several peppermints into his mouth. The simple explanation did not make sense even to him. But what was the meaning and purpose of the smiling death mask? Mr. Bingler acted. He shoved a chair into the closet, lifted the bulky envelope from the dim recess of the high shelf. He returned to the bed, emptied the contents of the envelope onto the clean spread. He beamed a bit in pride at the tangible portions of the home detective course, and he was suddenly no more the humble bookkeeper the world knew, but Mr. J. C. Bingler, first-class detective. He ratcheted the slightly rusty handcuffs with gentle fingers, ruefully considering the fact that never had they closed on the frantic wrists of a public enemy. He fondled the fountain pen tear gas gun for a moment, practiced whipping it from an imaginary pocket at an imaginary villain. At last, satisfied that his reflexes and timing were good, he laid the pen aside, fumbled among the dog-eared booklets until he found one of a bilious blue. 
Settling himself on the bed, the death mask smiling sardonically in his intent face, he flipped thin pages with a wetted forefinger. Masks, he read aloud from a subchapter, have but one purpose in crime. They are used to shield the identities of criminals perpetrating a crime. Mr. Bingler clucked in disappointment, for it was only too obvious that his type of mask was not the style preferred by gun-wielding crooks. He flipped through the pages of the booklet, reading a snatch of print here and there, and as the second passed, shocked incredulity mirrored itself on Mr. Bingler's rabbity features. It couldn't be. Such a thing was impossible, and yet the fact spoke for itself. There was absolutely nothing in his cherished home detective course to beacon light his way to a clear understanding of why a master villain should possess a death mask. Mr. Bingler lit and puffed savagely at his seventh cigarette of the day, utterly reckless of the effect of too much nicotine on his heart. He shook his head slowly, began the distasteful task of dressing. He admitted discouragedly to himself that he was licked, for if the home detective course could not explain a death mask, then there was no explanation for it in criminal tactics. Mr. Bingler scowled truculently into the mirror, went slowly to the closet. He removed his Sunday suit, tossed it carelessly on the bed, covering the booklets and paraphernalia. There was a bitter twist to his mouth because of the disillusionment that filled his mind. Then he brightened a bit. Anyway, even without the mask, he still had a mystery that was just begging to be solved. He would trot down to the police station, tell Captain Donovan of the conversation he had overheard, and watch the ponderous machinery of the law bring the would-be murderers to justice. It was a very satisfying thought. He knotted his string tie around his celluloid collar, went slowly toward the hall door, at the muffled burr of the buzzer. Yes, he said inquiringly, poked his head through the door crack. The hall light was out, and his myopic gaze could make nothing of the indistinct features of the man whose fingers still pressed the buzzer. Mr. Bingler, a muffled voice asked casually. I'm Mr. Bingler, Mr. Bingler agreed. What can I do? The roof collapsed without warning onto Mr. Bingler's small and inadequately haired head. He passed out without a sound. Chapter 4 Wax Museum Mr. Bingler tried to run from the six-headed monster that was snuffling ferociously at his heels, but strain as he might, he could not lift his rooted feet out of their tracks. He tried to yell, and his voice came out in a tenuous whisper that hung in the air before his face. He groaned in terror and the sound brought him back to consciousness. He was lying on the divan, a wet towel tucked carefully around his aching head. He groaned again, lifted himself to a sitting position, wincing at the stab of pain that skidded around the inside of his skull. Oh, dear, he said miserably. He staggered to his feet, made an inspection of the apartment, expecting momentarily to be attacked again. But the apartment was empty his assailant having gone while he was unconscious. Turning on the cold tap in the bathroom, he tenderly bathed the goose egg on his head, his thoughts gradually marshalling themselves into a faint semblance of order. He couldn't fully understand why his assailant had paused long enough to lay a wet towel over his aching head, and then apparently gone without touching anything. A sudden premonition touched his aching brain. He wrapped a dry towel about his head, went into the bedroom, he frowned a bit when he found that he was right. The wax mask was gone, and in its place was the new derby resting in another hat box. Mr. Bingler swore rather violently, a small, hot lump of fury blazing into life in his scrawny breast. This was the last straw. He lifted the hat box to one side, caught sight of the bit of blue sticker on the bottom. Axe Museum, he read, and his mental teeth took a healthy bite of the lonesome clue. He dressed rapidly in the suit he'd worn all day, hanging the Sunday suit back in the closet. He clipped the tear gas gun into his vest pocket, thrust the handcuffs into a hip pocket. He switched off the lights, went into the hall, squirmed into the neat rubbers and raincoat. He removed an umbrella from the rack, an umbrella that could become a gleaming sword by a mere twist of his wrist. He was conscious of a weight on his right hand, and he peered proudly at the first ring he had worn in years. It was a large, golden-brown cameo with two heads, 
and it seemed strangely out of place on his tiny veined hand. Mr. Bingler's face was hard with purpose, and his eyes dark with anger, as he locked the apartment and raced down the two flights of stairs. He felt that he had been on the receiving end of a dirty deal. He didn't know what a mask had to do with a murder, but he did know that he was going to put a stop to the machinations of the master villain, one way or another. This entire affair had become rather personal to Mr. Bingler. Taxi, mister? A prowling cabbie called to the small man in the raincoat. Mr. Bingler nodded absently, climbed into the rear of the taxi. He seated himself exactly in the center of the cushions, braced his feet on the footrail. Where to, buddy? Mr. Bingler considered. How many wax museums in town? He asked. Just one that I know of. Upon Tenth Avenue. Want to go there? Yes, Mr. Bingler said shortly, and, ah, uh, take the lead out of your trousers. Take the... The cabbie took in the derby, the raincoat, and the umbrella in one inclusive glance. Okay, Grandpop, hang on to your upper plate, he finished dryly. Mr. Bingler regretted his use of the unfamiliar words he had used for without even a preliminary shifting of gears, the taxi took off down the street. For the first time in quite a while, Mr. Bingler left grateful to Isaac Newton and his law of gravity, for with but a bit of coaxing the taxi would have taken off like a mail plane. Mr. Bingler swallowed his heart, clung to his derby with both hands, his stomach banking in sympathy as the taxi swished and swayed through the light traffic. This fast enough, mister? the cabbie asked casually. Mr. Bingler nodded wordlessly, too paralyzed to speak. He watched the world whiz giddily past, and his small mouth made the same gasping movements made by a fish drowning on dry land. This is it, buddy, the cabbie said eventually, whirled the taxi into the curb with a banshee wail of screaming rubber. Thanks, Mr. Bingler said weakly, poured himself onto the sidewalk. He was just regaining his land legs when it dawned on him that he had received no change from the dollar bill he had tendered in payment for the fare. Mr. Bingler grimaced, peered regretfully after the taxi. This mystery was proving expensive, both in mental shock and cash. He looked up at the tarnished sign, Wax Museum, then trudged casually down the street toward the darkness of an alleyway, certain that he was unseen. He ducked into its depths edged along the building wall until he came to the sliver of light that edged from beneath a pulled shade. Pulling a box from a rubbish pile, he climbed atop its frail structure, applied one eye to the silt of light. Ha! <laughs> said Mr. Bingler silently, triumphantly. Lying on the single table in the small room was the death mask, and over it a man was paying money to a second man. Mr. Bingler felt an instinctive distrust of the man doing the paying, for with his heavy jowls and hard eyes, he fitted perfectly into the number three classification of criminals, as given in Lesson 7 of the Home Detective Course. Mr. Bingler's gray little ego swelled with budding life when he realized that the mask was part of some mystery and that his deductions were working with astounding clarity. There was a tiny creak, and the box collapsed beneath Mr. Bingler. He squawked in sudden fright, clutched at the wall, went tumbling to the pavement. With his heart in his throat, he scurried breathlessly out of the alley mouth, hopped into a parked taxi. He hunched down into the seat, knowing that he had been seen by the doorman of the wax museum, expecting to hear the scream of flying lead at any moment. Center Street Police Station, he snapped at the driver, breathed in sudden relief as the taxi spurted into the traffic. Mr. Bingler smiled then, his eyes lighting up like those of a mischievous brownie's. Mr. Bingler was in his element, and very, very happy. End of this installment of Mr. Bingler's Murder Maze Tune in tomorrow for Part 2, which begins with Chapter 5 Pink Hitler There was an unhurried bustle about the police station that was like balm to Mr. Bingler's quivering nerves. He scuttled through the doorway, passed unnoticed into the waiting room, knocked timidly on the door marked Captain Donovan.